بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أما بعد Today inshallah we will begin going over a book a book by the name Advices that pertain to rectifying the household Basically what this book is about, how to raise your household based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Naam. And we give an advice, if there's any sisters downstairs, and there's kids playing, or they're making noise, to please discipline the child, to make him sit down so everyone could benefit. Khalafikum. The first lesson, again this book is by Sheikh Khalid Dhufayri. And alhamdulillah, we translated it. So soon it will be published. Very soon. And once it's published, then inshallah you guys can have the English version of it. However, I'm going to be reading from the Arabic. But soon you will have the English version. Bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. It's already been translated. The first chapter is about the importance of rectifying the household based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah. As we know that the Qur'an and the Sunnah it came with everything. How to live your life. How to be a father. How to be a wife. How to be a child. How to be a neighbor. It gave rights for everyone. Alhamdulillah. The religion is complete. And from the most important things that the religion of Islam focuses on, rectifying the household by raising it by the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And we see that in the prophets and messengers throughout the Qur'an. That the prophets and messengers, they would raise their children based on the commands of Allah. If we look at the prophet Ya'qub, when Ya'qub was at the moment of death, Allah said, إِذْ حَذَرَ يَعْقُوبَ الْمَوْتِ إِذْ قَالَ لِبَنِيهِ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ When Ya'qub was at the time of death, he told his children, Who will you worship after me? Meaning after I'm gone. Look at the most important thing that he focused on at the time of death. He told his children, what did he say? Who are you going to worship after me? Meaning after I'm gone. Look at the response of the children. They said, Verily we will worship your Lord. And the Lord of Ibrahim, your father Ibrahim, and the Lord of Ismail, and the Lord of Ishaq, ilahan wahida, one Lord, and we will be Muslims to him. Likewise, if we look at Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, the way he raised his children, what were the names of the children of Ibrahim? Anyone knows? Naam. Ismail and Ishaq. Ibrahim was known as Abu al-Anbiya. He was the father of the prophets and messengers. Because the prophets and messengers that came after him were from his what? Offsprings. Ismail, he was the father of the Arab. Ishaq was the father of Bani Israel. So after Ibrahim, majority of the prophets and messengers, they came from where? Bani Israel. Except who? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He was the final prophet and messenger. So all of them are the children of Ibrahim. Is that clear? And Ibrahim would raise his children upon the commands of Allah. And we see that importance that he gives. When Allah, in a dream, he showed him and commanded him to slaughter his own son Ismail. Imagine if you're commanded to slaughter your own son. How difficult of a task would that be? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he commanded Ibrahim to slaughter his son, Allah said, قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أَذْبَحُكَ فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى Ibrahim said to his son Ismail, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ السَّعِي When Ismail reached the age of Sa'i, what does Sa'i mean? The age of youth. 
the age of youth, meaning he's a, now he can travel with his father. And the scholars, they mention, why did Allah command Ibrahim to slaughter his son Ismail at that age? Who knows? Naam. He had the knowledge to know what's right from wrong, tayyib. But the scholars, they mention that the father is most attached to his child at that age. The age of Sa'i. So Allah commanded Ibrahim to slaughter his son Ismail at that age when he loved him the most. Is that clear? Because when the child is too, too old, he becomes what? Independent. When the child is too young, the father doesn't love the child as much as he loves him when he becomes at that age, when he starts to travel with him, walk with him. Naam, is that clear? So when Ismail reached the age of Sa'i, Allah commanded Ibrahim to slaughter his son Ismail. And Ismail was the most beloved thing to Ibrahim. So Allah tested him by what? By that which he loves. Showing that Allah will test us with that which we love. Naam. So then, he said, Oh my son, I see in my dream that I slaughtered you. And the prophets and messengers, their dreams are what? Revelation. Their dreams are revelation. So what was the response of his son? Anyone knows? What was the response of Ismail? Naam. Naam. He said, Oh my father, fulfill what you have been commanded. He did not say, Oh my father, slaughter me, even though that's what it entails, right? He said, Fulfill what you are commanded, meaning what? Fulfill the command of Allah, regardless of what it is. Obey your Lord, even if it entails that what? To slaughter me. So we see this relationship that Ibrahim has with his son based on what? The commands of Allah. They have the utmost respect for the commands of Allah. Allah tested both of them, the father and the son, and they both passed. Is that clear? Allah tested the father to what? Slaughter his son who he loves most. And Allah tested the son to what? To be slaughtered. To obey his father and to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see both of them pass that test. They fulfill the command of Allah. Slaughtering. Slaughtering. Naam. But he did not slaughter his son. When he was about to slaughter his son, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, Ya Ibrahim, qad saddaqt al you have fulfilled the test. You have passed the test. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He ransomed him for what? For a ram. Is that clear? He did not slaughter his son. It was a test and he passed. Instead, he slaughtered the ram. That's why on Eid al-Adha, what do we do? We slaughter a ram following the sunnah of who? Our father Ibrahim. Is that clear? So, the author, he says, لا شك يا إخواني أن هذه الدار كلها دار اختبار وابتلاء This dunya that we live in, all of it is a test. So the Muslim, he lives in this life, his health and his wealth, his children, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the Muslim, all of it is a test. And this is why it's important to know. Many of us, we think a test means that you're going through hardship. A test does not only mean when you're going through hardship. A test can be by the bounties. Allah Ta'ala can test you by what? By giving you. What is He testing you? Will you be grateful? Will you be from the grateful servants who fulfill the commands of Allah? Or will you become arrogant and turn away? As Allah says, وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالْخَيْرِ وَالشَّرِّ fitna." We're going to test you with the good and with the evil as a trial. And to us you shall return. Meaning to us you will be held accountable. So if Allah Ta'ala, He tests you by giving you wealth. A person may have a lot of wealth. What is that? A test from Allah. Why is Allah testing him? What? Will he fulfill the commands of Allah with that wealth? How will he use that wealth? Will he give in charity? Will he fulfill the, the needs of his family? Or will he become stingy and turn away from the commands of Allah? Is that clear? Or Allah Ta'ala may test you through trials, difficulty. Allah Ta'ala, he's the most wise. He tests his servant in different ways. But all of it is a test. Hardship and ease, all of it is a test. Is that clear? Naam. So he says, 
in order to show that Allah may give the individual from the bounties, in order to test him, will he become from the grateful servants? In order to be grateful to Allah, the scholars, they say there are three pillars. Number one, you ascribe the blessing to Allah. That's number one. What does that mean? You ascribe the blessing to Allah. As Allah says, وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ Allah. Every bounty that you have is from Allah. So you do not ascribe it to who? To your own self, to your own nafs, to your own ego, to your own knowledge. Naam? As some of those who Allah destroyed, what did they say when they saw the kingdom with Fir'aun and others than them? قَالَ إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيتُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي I acquired all of this from my knowledge, from my intelligence. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them from their arrogance. And this is dangerous because the scholars they mention that the test that Allah ta'ala may test the individual through blessings can be greater than the test of difficulty. Why? Because when Allah ta'ala may give you wealth, when Allah ta'ala may give you a car, may Allah ta'ala may give you position, Allah ta'ala may give you power, it's easy to become arrogant. It's easy to turn away. It's easy. But when you're going through difficulty, when you're going through poverty, when you're going through sickness, it's what? It's very easy to what? To turn back to Allah. Is that clear? So sometimes the test of bounties is greater than the test of difficulty. But all of it is a test. Is that clear? Naam. So he said that Allah Ta'ala may test the servant. Will he use these bounties to, f- to fulfill the commands and the legislation of Allah or will he not? So we said the pillars of showing gratitude are how many? Three. Number one, you ascribe the blessing to Allah. Number two is what? You mention it. You mention it. What does that mean you mention it? You mention it in the form of glorifying Allah. Anyone know the proof of that? Alhamdulillah. Uh, Naam. But there's a specific proof. We all know the surah. وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثِ As for the bounties of your Lord, then mention it. Speak of it. You mention the bounties of Allah in the form of glorifying Him. That's the second pillar. The third pillar, and the scholars say this is from the most important ones, you use the bounty to worship Allah. Is that clear? For example, if you want to show gratitude to Allah for the eyes, how do we show gratitude to Allah for the eyes? You look at that which is permissible. And if you look at that which is impermissible, then you are from the ungrateful. If you want to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your ears, how do we thank Allah for the ears? Listening to that which is what? Brings you closer to Allah. Listening to Quran. Listening to beneficial lectures. Here you are showing gratitude to Allah. And if you show gratitude to Allah, then Allah ta'ala promises that He will what? Increase you in your blessings. Is that clear? The third pillar. So we said, what are the three pillars? Showing gratitude to Allah. How do we show gratitude? Number one, you ascribe the bounty to Allah. Number two, mentioning it in the form of glorifying. Not in the form of arrogance. Number three is what? Use that blessing to worship Allah. If you fulfill these, then you have become from the grateful servants of Allah. And majority of the children of Adam are ungrateful to Allah. Who knows the proof of that? Allah says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُودِ Man is ungrateful to his Lord. This is the asl. This is the origin of man. We are ungrateful. If we get money, what do we do? We become arrogant. This is from my blood, sweat, and tears. I earned this. We become stingy. We don't go give charity. We don't show gratitude to Allah. We don't increase in the worship of Allah. Look, some people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases them in, in, in risk. Allah ta'ala may give you a job. He increases you in wealth. Some people, what do they do? Now you see them going away from the masjid. Now you see them what? Stop praying in the masjid. Now they become too busy. They become arrogant, turning away. This is dangerous. Because now you are becoming what? Ungrateful for that blessing. Now you're on the brink of losing that blessing. Is that clear? So when Allah gives you a blessing, show gratitude to Allah, come to the masjid, learn your religion, so Allah Ta'ala may what? Give you more and increase you in that bounty. Tayyib. He says, so happiness is found in showing gratitude to Allah. And happiness is found in the worship of Allah. And happiness is found in seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from your sins. This is where happiness is found. 
as Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Likewise, the next point the Shaykh mentions. He said, فَنَحْنُ نُبْتَلَى فِي هَذِهِ الدُّنْيَا Allah test us in this dunya. We say Allah may test us with what? The good and the evil, the bad. All of it is a test. But why does Allah test the individual? To distinguish what? Who is truthful to him and who is a liar. Who is a believer from who is a what? Hypocrite. Is that clear? How does Allah distinguish the truthful from the liar? Through these tests. Allah subhanahu wa because it's easy. Everyone can say I'm a Muslim. Everyone can say I love Allah. I love Allah so much. If you say you love Allah, Allah will test you. To distinguish you from the liar. Naam. So Allah says, Alif Lamim. Ahasibannas and Yutraku. And Yaqulu Amanna wahum la yuftanun. Allah says, Does man think that they will say, I believe? And that they will not be tested. Allah says, Walakat fatanna ladina min kablihim. Verily we tested those who came before you. فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ الصَّدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ So Allah Ta'ala may distinguish the truthful ones from the liars. May Allah Ta'ala make us from the truthful. May Allah Ta'ala protect us from hypocrisy. Showing that Allah Ta'ala test His servant to distinguish the truthful, the mu'min from the munafiq. The truthful from the liar. So from the test that Allah Ta'ala He tests us with is that He gives us a family. That he gives us children, that he gives us a wife, or for the sister, that he gives you a husband. Allah will test you through these. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Kullukum ra'in, wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyate." All of you are shepherds, and all of you are responsible for your flock. What does that mean? All of you are shepherds. The husband is the shepherd of his household. He is responsible for his household. The wife is, is responsible for the house of her husband and the children. She is responsible for that. What does that mean she is responsible? She will be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about it. It's a heavy responsibility. And it is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How will you raise your children? Will you fulfill that amana, Raising them to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the shaykh, he says, what does it mean that we're responsible for our flock? A, meaning that you will stand before Allah and you will be held accountable for it. May Allah keep us firm on the day of judgment. May Allah Ta'ala make it an easy day for us. The day when we stand before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, The Imam, he is a shepherd and he is responsible for his flock. The man, the husband, he is a shepherd and he is responsible for his home. Likewise, the woman, the wife, she is a shepherd and she is responsible for her home. Likewise, the servant is responsible for the wealth of their master. Likewise, an employer, he is responsible for what? His employee and the job. All of this is a amana, is a trust. And it is a test that we will be... What does it mean that you're responsible? What does it mean? Huh? Naam, you take the role that this is an amana, but here we said, a mas'ul, a muhasab. Well, naam, what does it mean when the Prophet says you're responsible for your flock? That you will be what? Accountable. Held accountable by it in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to stand before Allah and you will be asked about it. Why? Because it is a what? It is a test. Is that clear? May Allah keep us firm. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَائِلٌ كُلَّ رَاعٍ عَمَّ اسْتَرْعَاهُ أَحَفِظَ ذَلِكَ أَمْ ضَيَّعَهُ Allah Ta'ala will ask each shepherd for that which he was responsible for. Did he preserve it or did he lose it? Did you preserve that amana or did you lose it? And when we mean preserving, here the shaykh says, for example, you're going to be asked about your child. Did you preserve him or did you lose him? You're going to be asked about your daughter. Did you preserve her or did you lose her? Because it is a what? A test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does it mean? Did you preserve her or did you preserve him? What does it mean? A, did you preserve their religion first and foremost? 
Likewise, from the matters of the dunya as well. Did you shelter them? Did you give them a home? Naam, all of this you will be questioned about. But the most important thing, that which gives priority first, did you preserve for them their religion? Did you nurture them upon the commands of Allah? He says, بَلِ الْأَصْلُ حِفْظٌ فِي الدِّينَ The origin of preserving your children is preserving for them their religion. حِفْظَ الْوَلَدْ فِي دِينِهِ You preserve the child his religion and to obey his Lord. And you, and you preserve the child, the daughter, in her religion and to obey her Lord and to take care of the prayers. Teaching them how to read the Qur'an. Teaching them the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. All of this you will be, you will be asked about the day when you stand before Allah. Because it is an amana, it is a heavy amana. And this is something that is important because today we see many of our children are not being taught. Sometimes we see many families, they think the children teach them in the masjid. When you go home, let them do whatever they want. Let them watch whatever they want. They have a phone, they're watching all the fitna, and you don't even care. Is that does that, in, does that show that you're preserving the right, that test? No, that shows that you are what? You are slacking in that. The child is not only nurtured, taught his religion in the masjid. Rather, first it starts at home. The mother and the father, they teach their children their religion, how to pray, how to read Qur'an, what is the sunnah, what is the innovation, how to fear Allah, what will take place in the grave, what will take place today when we stand before Allah. All of this, the parents, that is your responsibility to teach your children. And don't wait until it's too late. Until they become independent. Now you can't hold them anymore. Now you want to force them. It's too late. Because the nurturing happens when we're in the beginning, when they're young. That's when it starts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, likewise He says, about the importance of preserving the family, saving them from the hellfire. That we are commanded not only to save ourselves from the hellfire, but likewise to save our families. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا O oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your families from the hellfire. Is that clear? So we are commanded not only to save ourselves, but likewise, our families, our children, our brothers and our sisters, our fathers and our mothers, calling them to Tawheed. And this is the way of the prophets and messengers. All of them started by teaching their families before they taught anyone else. Teaching their families Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He mentions Ismail, look, we're now we're going to go over the different prophets and messengers, and how the importance they gave when it came to teaching their family Islam. We have to follow the way of the prophets and messengers, all of them. They all came with the same sunnah, they all came with the same way, teaching them, their wives, their children, to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says about Ismail, look what Allah says, who's Ismail? Sudais, who's Ismail? Said Ibrahim's son. He is the father of who? Ismail is the father of who? Ahmed. He is fa- Ahsad, he is the father of the Arab. Who is Ismail's brother? Ishaq. Ishaq is the father of who? Bani Israel. Ahsad. So Ismail, Allah says about Ismail. Wadkur fil kitabi Ismail. And mention in the book Ismail, إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ He was true to what he promised. وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّ And he was a noble prophet and messenger. And then Allah says about Ismail, وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ And he used to command his family to prayer. وَالزَّكَاءَ And to charity. وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيَّ And Allah was pleased with him. Why was Allah pleased with him? He was a prophet and messenger, but from the greatest of means, what does Allah say? Kana what? He used to do what? He used to command what? He used to command his family to what? Salah and zakah. He used to command his family to prayer and to charity. And because of that, Allah Ta'ala was pleased with him. He was a noble prophet and messenger. And this is something Allah praises Ismail here, because he used to command his family to the worship of Allah. And they did not take that matter lightly. 
They did not take that matter lightly. It's okay, my son, he can watch TV. He can watch the phone. He can listen to some music. He can go to the park and play. It's okay. They take it as some people, even Muslims, as something that it's what? It's light. It's okay. It's not light. If it was light, the prophets and messengers wouldn't start with that by first commanding their own family. Because no one wants to see their children go in the hellfire. Likewise, no one wants to see their parents go to the hellfire. If you have parents that are not Muslim, you should be calling them Tawheed. Look at Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, his father was a what? Bilal. Ibrahim, his father was what? He was a Muslim or a kafir? Ibrahim, naam. Who knows? Ibrahim's father was a mushrik. And if we see the efforts that Ibrahim gave to giving da'wah to his father, you would say, subhanallah, you're falling short if your parents are non-Muslim. He would non-stop give him da'wah with kindness. So much so his father said, if you don't stop, I'm going to stone you, stop. And Ibrahim would keep going, I'm going to make du'a for you. I'm going to keep, oh my father, why are you worshipping that? Oh my father, why? No one wants to see their parents die upon shirk. Because if you die upon shirk, then what is the result of that? You will enter into the hellfire for eternity. And you will never leave from it. How do you believe in Allah in the last day and you're okay that your parents are upon shirk? How do you believe in la ilaha illallah and you know that if someone dies upon shirk, that they enter into the hellfire for eternity, they will never enter into Jannah. And your parents are upon shirk and you're doing nothing to give them da'wah. How are you a Muslim and you believe in that? Naam, we have to give efforts if our parents, our neighbors, our cousins are non-Muslim, we have to push more. Look at Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah said, Ya abati, lima ta'budu ma la yasma'u, wa la yubusiru, wa la yughni anka shay'a. Oh my father, why are you worshipping that which cannot hear you, which cannot see you, which cannot benefit you in any way? Again, da'wah to his father. Look at Luqman. Who did Luqman give advice to? Ahmed. Jamal, Afwan. Who did Luqman? Ibrahim gave advice to his father. Ismail gave advice to who? His family. What did he command them to do? Salah and what? Zakat. Who did Luqman advise? Who can hear? Naam. His son. What did Luqman advise his son to do? Ya Bunayya. What did he say? Oh my son, do not what? Ya Bunayya, la tushrik billah. Oh my son, do not associate partners with Allah. That is the first advice Luqman gave to his son. And this shows the methodology of how we should give da'wah to our children. We start with what? Tawheed. Start teaching them the proper aqidah. Start teaching them about la ilaha illallah. Warning them from shirk. Warning them from worshipping other than Allah. We start with that. And then we go to salah. And then we go to zakah. We go to, from there we go on. Likewise, if we look at Nuh, Nuh alayhi salatu was salam, he was the first what? He was the first messenger. Who was the first prophet? Naam. Adam. Who was the first messenger? Nuh. Who was the last prophet and messenger? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Nuh, the first messenger. His son was a what? A kafir. Nuh's son was a kafir. Showing that Allah may test you. That your son, his guidance is not in your hands. Allah may test you with a parent that is not Muslim. But you're, you're, you, on you, you have to give da'wah. You have to give da'wah. Nuh alayhi salatu was salam, Allah says about him, وَهِيَ تَجْرِي بِهِمْ فِي مَوْجٍ كَالْجِبَالِ And the ship, it sailed them amidst the waves like a mountain. When Nuh was on the ship. And Nuh called out to his son, وَنَادَى نُوحٌ يَا وَنَادَى نُوحٌ ابْنَهُ وَكَانَ فِي مَعْزِلٍ And Nuh called out to his son, and his son was separate from him. What did he say? يَا بُنَيْ إِرْكَبْ مَعَنَا Oh my son, come with us. Come. وَلَا تَكُمْ مَعَ الْكَافِرِينَ Don't be with the kuffar. And his son refused. He did every effort that he could to what? Come. Come with the people of Iman. Likewise, this shows the importance of our children having righteous companions. Keeping our children away from wicked friends. And I'm speaking to everyone here. Stay away from bad companions. Is that clear? 
from the harms of bad companions is that the bad companion will lead you to the hellfire. Who can give me an example of that? A bad companion can lead you to the hellfire. Ahmed. Story of Nuh. Nah, nah. That's the, that's the example we just gave. Good. That's good. But I want to talk about Abu Jahl. Who knows the story of Abu Jahl? Abu Talib. When Abu Talib, who's Abu Talib? The uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He defended Islam. At the time of death, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this shows how the Prophet Muhammad tried his best to what give da'wah to his uncle. Calling them to la ilaha illallah. The Prophet gave much effort. When Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, was at his deathbed, what took place? The Prophet ﷺ went to his uncle. He said, Ya Am, Qul la ilaha illallah. Oh my uncle, say la ilaha illallah. Kalima, one word, one statement that I will intercede to Allah on behalf of you for it. I will intercede. I will intercede for you to Allah. Just say this one word, La ilaha illallah. Look at the effort the Prophet would keep saying, Ya am, qul la, oh man, say La ilaha illallah. This is what we should be calling our families to. Oh uncle, oh aunt, oh father, oh mother, just say La ilaha illallah. Come to Islam. Why? Because no one wants to see their relative die upon shirk. So when Abu Talib was at his deathbed, what did he say? Who was there? Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was a friend of Abu Talib. But he was a bad friend. Abu Jahl said, أَتَرْغَبُ عَنْ مِلَّةِ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ He said to Abu Talib when he's at his deathbed, are you going to leave the religion of your grandfather, Abdul Muttalib? Abu Jahl knew how to get Abu Talib. He knew that this was his what? His weak spot because he was very tribal. You want to leave the way of your uncle, of your, of your grandfather? And then what happened? Abu Talib died upon shirk. Why did he die upon shirk? This is from the decree of Allah. But from the means of why he died upon shirk is because he had a what? A bad companion. And this shows that your bad companion, that they want you to die upon that evil that you're on. They don't want good for you. Is that clear? Because once you leave that evil that they're upon, they don't want to be your friends anymore. The bad companion, they don't want good for you. So you have to leave them off for the sake of Allah. And we have to be careful when it comes to our children. Who are their companions? Don't let them just befriend anyone. Naam. Likewise, we see in all the other prophets and messengers, the importance that they gave to calling their family to la ilaha illallah. Likewise, the Prophet Muhammad. Who was the Prophet Muhammad first commanded to obey, or uh, to command? What does Allah say? وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Allah says, command your family to prayer and be patient upon it. Who is Allah commanding here? The Prophet Muhammad. And be patient upon it. لَا نَسْأَلُكَ رِزْقَى We do not ask you for provision. نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكَ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلتَّقْوَى We are going to provide for you. And the end result is for the people of taqwa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, when Allah ta'ala commands the Prophet Muhammad to command his family to prayer, Allah says, be what? Be patient upon it. This is an indication that when it comes to commanding your family to the obedience of Allah, that you might endure some sort of harm, but be patient and don't stop and keep going. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tests us through our families from another angle as well. Allah says, "Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu, la tulhikum amwalukum wa la awladukum an dhikrillah." O oh, you who believe, do not let your wealth and your children distract you from the remembrance of Allah. Wa may yaf'al dhalik, fa ulaika hum al-khasirun. And whosoever does allows for that to happen, then they are from the losers. So Allah says, do not allow for what? Your what? Your wealth and your children to distract you from the remembrance of Allah. 
Here's another test. Do not, first of all, we are tested by what? Commanding them to the worship of Allah. Likewise, we are tested by not allowing them to distract you from the worship of Allah. From that is the five daily prayers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says in this ayah, the shaykh, he says, فَإِذَا اشْتَغَلْتَ وَالْتَهَيْتَ بِالْوَلَدْ وَبِالْمَالْ عَنْ طَعَةِ اللَّهِ فَأَنْتَ مُقَصَّرْ He said, if you are busy and you are preoccupied with your wealth and your children from the remembrance of Allah, then you have fallen short. That's one way of falling short. Is that clear? Because there's two ways to fall short here. One way is what? That your wealth and your children, they are distracting from the remembrance of Allah. He said, وَإِذَا الْتَهَيْتَ بِنَفْسِكَ عَنْ وَلَدِكَ and if you are preoccupied from nurturing your child, him by reminding them of the remembrance of Allah, likewise you have fallen short. So there are two ways to fall short here. What is the first way? That they distract you from the remembrance of Allah. For example, the five daily prayers. The second way is that what? You are preoccupied so much so that you do not teach them their religion. And we see that today. We see that today. Everyone is so busy that they don't know where their children are. Your children might be in the park smoking. Your children might be in the park hanging out with bad companions. But you're so busy chasing after the risk, the provision. That you are falling short with your family. And this is a great sin. And this is why Allah says... Command Allah when He commanded the Prophet, what did He say? Command your family to what? Salah and be patient upon it. Then what did Allah say? We do not ask you for what? Provision. We are the ones who provide for you. Meaning, well, Allah does not need your provision. Do not allow for the provision to distract you from commanding your family to salah. Do not allow for your work from distracting you to teaching your children their religion. That is a huge sin. And that is something we see today. Wallahu al-musta'an. He said, if you are too busy from teaching your children their religion, then this is a fitna. This is a trial. And you will be from the khasirin. You will be from the losers. May Allah protect us from that. He says, حَتَّى يَكُونْ وَلَدَكْ وَبَيْنَكْ وَبَيْتَكْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكْ بِسَبَبْ تَقْسِيرِكْ he says so much so if you don't if you're so busy you don't have time to teach your children then your children and your entire home will be corrupted because of you you are the reason because you did not give time to teach and nurture your children and then you wait till they get older and you can't control them anymore but where were you in the beginning you were too busy you didn't know where they went you let them watch whatever they want. You let them have any friends that they want. And now when they're older, you say, what do I do? But whose fault is it really? You fell short. Because you were too preoccupied that you didn't fulfill your obligation by teaching your, the ch your children. And that is their right above you. That is your children's right. You teach them their religion. For the sisters, you teach them how to cover. You teach them shyness. You teach them how to read the Qur'an. You teach them to be good companions. You teach them the classes. For the children likewise, same thing. You teach them the, that is their right above you. That is an obligation upon you. And as the Prophet said what? You are all shepherds and you will be questioned about your flock. The day when you stand before Allah, Allah Ta'ala will question you about this. Did you fulfill that amana, that trust? He said, فَلَا يَسْمَعُ الْوَلَدَ النُّصْءُ وَالتَّذْكِيرِ He said, now, since you didn't preoccupy, since you were so preoccupied, and you did not teach your children their religion, now they're older, now they don't listen to any advice. Now they don't respect their elders. Now they don't have mercy on the young. Now they have no manners, no etiquette. Why? Because you were too preoccupied that you did not fulfill your obligation by teaching them when they were young. May Allah make us better. He said, now your child is taking the path of corruption. And now you cannot control the matters. Because you did not follow the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad by teaching your children and raising your family upon the Kitab and the Sunnah. He said, and you did not teach them and raise them 
when they were young in the beginning. As Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, inna min azwajikum wa awladikum adun wallakum fahdharuhum. Allah says, O you who believe, verily your wives and your children, they are your enemy. So be cautious of them. What does this mean? What does this mean? وَالْحَذْرُ هنا نعم He says وَالْحَذْرُ هنا يكون في بداية الأمر حين الإصلاح فإذا لم تستطع إصلاح ولدك ولا إصلاح زوجك ولا إصلاح بنتك فأنت عند ذلك في فتنة عظيمة He said the meaning the حذر the warning He says it is done in the beginning of the matter when you're first raising your family when you're first rectifying, nurturing your family. He says, if you are unable to rectify your child and your wife and your household, then you have fell into this fitna, this great fitna. قَدْ تَكُونْ سَبَبًا فِي هَلَاكِكْ That this fitna will be the reason for your downfall. وَضِيَاعِكْ بِسَبَبِ إِهْمَالِكَ وَتَقْسِيرِكَ And that you will fail because you did not take this matter and give it any importance. Because of this, Allah said, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna. Verily, your wives and your children are a what? Fitna. Allah will test you through them. Naam. He says, لِذَلِكَ تَجِدْ لِجَانِبِ الْاِهْتِمَامِ بِالْبَيْتِ عِنْدَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, because of this, when you look at the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, he gave great importance when it came to raising his household and his children and his wives. He gave them time. He said he gave great importance to raising the household based on what? The Quran and the Sunnah and the commands of Allah. He said the Prophet ﷺ, he would give great importance to nurturing the household. Likewise, he would, he would go out in da'wah. Likewise, he would go out in jihad, striving. Likewise, he would go out teaching the Sahaba. And with all of this, look how busy the Prophet ﷺ is. Out fighting in war, teaching the Sahaba, getting revelation, and with all this, he still gave their family their right. Yet today we say we're busy. We're busy. I can't teach my son. Your son is 13 years old, he don't know how to pray. Whose fault is that? Wallahi, we need to be honest with ourselves. Your son's 15 years old. He doesn't know how to read Surah Al-Fatiha. He doesn't even pray. Whose fault is that? And sometimes we have to what hold ourselves accountable. And admit, naam, I fell short, I need to fix it. Because if we don't admit it, then we'll never fix the problem. So he said, the Prophet ﷺ did not fall short. And he had nine wives. And he had children. And he had grandchildren. And with all of this, he gave their children their due right, and their family their due right, and nurtured them based on the commands of Allah. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ The best of you, are those who are the best of you to your family. وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِ And I am the best from amongst you to my family. The Prophet said what? The best of you are what? Are the best of you to your family. Some people you see, they come out, mashallah, they're so righteous. They go to the masjid, they go out, they say, Allah said, the messenger said, Alhamdulillah, that's good, that's khayr. But when it comes to their home, they become monsters. وَالْعِيَاذُ billah. This is a clear sign of nifaq, hypocrisy. Because if you were truly righteous, you truly feared Allah, the ones who would love you most is your family. Your wife, your husband, your children, they would see your righteousness. But if everyone sees you as righteous and your family says you're a hypocrite, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. So the Prophet said, the best of you are the best of you to your family. And how do we become the best of you to your family? By what? Nurturing them upon what? The kitab and the sunnah. Nurturing our household on the commands of Allah. The same way Ibrahim did. The same way Ismail did. The same way Luqman did. The same way Ishaq did. The same way Muhammad did. This is with the, the way of all the prophets and the messengers. And from the ways that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam... Naam, I think we'll stop here. You want to stop here? Anyone have any questions? Or we want to continue? We continue? Tayyib. 17, Tayyib. From the ways that the Prophet ﷺ, Ishfi, 
خلاص خليه ينزل. From the ways that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would give great importance to raising the family based on the Quran and the Sunnah, he said, "Maru awladukum bil salah wa hum abna usab." وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا وَهُمْ أَبْنَاءُ عَشْرٍ He said, command your children and teach them to pray when they are seven. And beat them upon the prayer when they are ten. Meaning not a harmful beating. When they are the age of what? Ten. They must start praying. So from the ways to nurture your family upon the Quran and the Sunnah, when they are at the age of seven, you start commanding them to prayer. When they're at the age of ten years, the age of seven, now you start teaching them how to pray. Likewise, you teach them the Quran. And from the ways, if they memorize a surah, give them a gift. So what? To keep them motivated. Now they want to memorize another one. They're children. Give them another gift. Let them love learning the religion. Give them that love. When they pray, come on, let's go out. You just prayed, mashallah, let's go. Let them love doing acts of worship. He said, you command them seven and you beat them upon the prayer ten. That's one of the ways likewise. Likewise from the ways to nurture the family upon the kitab and the sunnah. Again, when we nurture our household on the kitab and the sunnah, this is when we'll have barakah in the home. This is when you'll see, mashallah, the children, the children will be upright by the permission of Allah. Nowadays, we see the houses are corrupt. Chaos. Fights. Why? Because we turned away from the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by nurturing our household based on the Qur'an and the sunnah. From the ways, likewise, of nurturing our family on the Qur'an and the sunnah, you pray the night prayer with your wife. Or if you're a wife, you pray the night prayer with your husband. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِذَا اسْتَيْقَضَ الرَّجُلُ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ If a man wakes up at night, فَأَيْقَضَ أَهْلَهُ فَصَلَّيَا رَكْعَتَيْنِ If a man wakes up during the night, he wakes up his wife, and they pray two rak'at, كُتِبَ جَمِيعًا مِنَ الذَّاكِرِينَ لِلَّهِ كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ Then Allah Ta'ala will write for them to be from those who remember Allah oftenly. Allah will make them from those who are what? Those who remember Allah oftenly. May Allah make us from them. The ذاكرين الله كثيرا That's a noble status. Allah praises those who, are that, those who remember and make lots of dhikr. One of the ways to reach that status is that you wake up your wife or the wife wakes up the husband at night, you pray two rak'at. And Allah Ta'ala will put the barakah in the home if we do that. Likewise, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that he used to teach his daughter Fatima the religion. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to say, Ya Fatima, binta Rasulillah, Salini bima shi'at. Salini bima shi'at. La ughni anki min Allahi shay'a. Wallahi, this is something that should give us goosebumps. The Prophet used to say to his daughter Fatima, Oh Fatima, ask me whatever you want from the dunya. I can't protect you from the punishment of Allah in any way. I cannot protect you from Allah. The dunya, I'll give you. But I can't protect you from Allah. This is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What about us when it comes to our children? Look at the importance the Prophet gave to his own daughter Fatima. Telling her to what? Teaching her. Fear Allah. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to his uncle, the importance he gave to his uncle Abu Talib, when he was at the time of death. As we said, what do we get? What do we learn from this lesson? Abu Talib, when he was at the time of death, what happened? We just mentioned it. Now, but what happened? When Abu Talib was at the time of death. Naam, what did the Prophet say to him? He told him, Say la ilaha illallah. Oh my uncle, say la ilaha illallah. One word. And then what did he do? Who was there? Abu Jahl. What did Abu Jahl say? Don't, are you going to leave the religion of your forefather? He knew his weak spot. Like a shaitan. Shaitan knows how to get you. From the traps of shaitan, is that if he knows you're emotional, He'll whisper to you things of emotion. If he knows you're intellectual, he will whisper to you doubtful matters. He knows how to get you. He knows you. He knows your weak spots. That's why we need to seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the plots of shaitan. Abu Jahl here, he said, what? Are you going to what? Turn away from the religion of your forefathers? Because he wanted to die upon what? 
shirk. That's why we need to stay away from bad companions. Bad companions, they want you to die upon shirk. They want you to die upon disbelief. They want you to die upon other than Islam. That's why Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu. What does Allah say? Oh, you who believe, what does Allah say? Another ayah, wa kunu sadiqeen And be with the truthful ones. The believers are with the believers. But where do we find the believers? In the homes of Allah, the masajid. Especially here. If you're not in the masajid, how are you going to be with the believers? Inevitably, you're going to take evil companions. If you're not with the sisters learning your religion, coming to the masjid, then who are your companions? People outside the masjid. The only way to have righteous companions is to be in the masjid. And to be with the brothers in the masjid. Otherwise, you're going to be with those evil companions. May Allah protect us from that. Showing the importance, we need to be in the masajid. We need to all aid one another when it comes to the worship of Allah. Allah says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَىٰ Aid one another when it comes to birr and taqwa, righteousness and piety. So the shaykh, he says, he continues, so if the house is upright, if the house is upright, then the next house will be upright, and then your house will be upright, her house will be upright, then the community will be upright. He said, once the community will be upright, then the leaders will be upright. Allah Ta'ala will bless you with the what? A righteous leader. Once the leader is upright, the land will be upright. This is how we rectify the land. Some people they say, the ruler, the ruler in the Muslim land, the ruler, the ruler. The reason why Allah Ta'ala may have tested us with an evil ruler is why? Because the people are evil. But if we focus on rectifying, and you see majority of these people saying, the ruler, the ruler, the ruler, you see their homes are the most corrupted homes. They're so focused on the ruler that they don't focus on nurturing their own what? Children. But if we focus on nurturing our children, protecting our household from the traps of shaitan, then one house will be upright, the next house will be upright, the community will be upright, then Allah Ta'ala will bless us with a righteous leader. Naam, of course we're referring to in the Muslim land. I think we'll stop here. Naam. Naam. We'll end it with this last point that the Sheikh makes. The Sheikh, he says, so a righteous home is from the greatest blessings that Allah gives to His servant. As Allah says, وَاللَّهُ جَعَلَ لَكُم مِّن بُيُوتِكُمْ سَكَنًا And Allah Ta'ala has made for you in your homes a rest place. A place of tranquility. A place of comfort. That the homes is a place of comfort. It's not a place of chaos. But how can we make that place, the home a place of comfort? By nurturing it upon the kitab and the sunnah. The way that all the prophets and messengers did. So if you see that Allah Ta'ala has blessed you with this blessing of having a righteous home, your children are upon istiqamah, your wife is upon istiqamah, your husband is upon istiqamah, you're all aiding one another upon the worship of Allah. There's no movies going on in the household, music going on in the household. All of that, what are you doing to your home? You're bringing the red carpet for shaitan. Is that clear? Some people, they're like, oh, it's only a TV, little by little. Now they're watching TV shows. Now they're watching comedy. Now they're watching movies. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, the angels do not enter a home where there is a kalb or a surah, where there is a dog or a picture hanging on the wall. The angels do not enter that home. What about today when you have music playing in the home? You think the angels are going to enter that home? You want the barakah to come to that home when you're putting evil in your home? Naam. You want Allah Ta'ala to put the barakah in the home when you open the red carpet for shaitan? So when the angels leave the home, then the shayateen, they infest that home. Once the shayateen infest that home, then you see the chaos that we see in our households. So if Allah Ta'ala has blessed you with a righteous home, this is from the greatest bounties that Allah Ta'ala gives to His servants. And we need to show the, uh, gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that blessing. As Allah says, وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الشُّكُورِ And few of His servants are from the grateful ones. May Allah ta'ala make us from those who are from the grateful. Yeah. 
if Allah Ta'ala has blessed you with this blessing, then the Shaykh, he says, it's upon us to follow a sunnah that many people have abandoned. And that is sujood as shukr, the prostration of shukr. If Allah Ta'ala had protected you from some harm, or if Allah Ta'ala had given you a blessing, like you see Allah Ta'ala has blessed you with a righteous child, or Allah Ta'ala has given you some provision, or if Allah Ta'ala had given you an, a new job, anything from the blessings that He has given you, one of the ways from the sunnah is you prostrate to Allah. And this is sujood as shukr, showing gratitude to Allah for this bounty. Is that clear? He said many people today, they have abandoned this sunnah. He said, however, this is from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu to show gratitude to Allah for His bounties. Naam, anyone have any questions before we end it? Any of the sisters have questions, they can write it up. No. Naam, you just make one sajda. And you say, yes, subhan rabbi la'ala. Subhan rabbi la'ala. And you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the bounties. Naam. Likewise, another thing the Sheikh mentions, an important point. He said, a lot of people today, they're so focused on the success of their child when it comes to dunya, like education, like risk provision. He's getting a job, my son is doing this, my son is, he got a new job, he's, he got, he's getting all A's, Naam. he's doing this, he's doing that. He's succeeding in the dunya. He said, this is good, but that's not the origin. The origin is that your son is righteous. That's the origin. That is the son who will, who will benefit you after you die. When you enter into your grave, all of the children of Adam stop except three. What are the three things? Naam. When the person dies, all of the children of Adam, all of his actions will stop except three. Huh? One of them is a righteous child. That makes dua for his parent. That is the child that's going to benefit you. As for the child who does not fear Allah, he can make millions. He's not going to benefit you when you enter into your grave. What you want is you want someone, your child, to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe through him you will enter into Jannah. Maybe through him you'll be saved from the punishment of the grave. Naam. So from the most important things is that we give importance Teaching our children Tawheed. Teaching them how to pray. Teaching them Qur'an. Keeping them away from bad companions. And Shaykh Salah al-Fawzan, he also mentions, don't let your child have a phone and watch whatever he wants. Supervise him. What is he watching? You're not fulfilling the amana. When you give him a phone, he's listening to music, he's watching movies. Because you gave him a phone. You think you're doing him a favor, reality is you're corrupting him. Yeah, I'm giving him a new phone. And he's watching haram. You're not, you're not benefiting him. He doesn't know he's a kid. You should know better. You're a child. I mean, you're an adult. Naam. Is that clear? So we need to supervise them when they have these phones. Don't just give them a phone and let them watch whatever they want. Naam. We'll stop it here, inshallah. Naam. If, no, if there's no questions from downstairs, then inshallah we'll end it here. Subhanak Allah. Hamdik shir wa illa anant astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Naam. Also, we want to mention, um, we're going to start our youth program. Starting next weekend, Saturday and Sunday, we're going to start a youth program from 10 a.m. to Dhuhr. And then after Dhuhr, Saturday and Sunday, we're going to have Qur'an class. Learning how to read the Qur'an, tajweed, memorization, going over the tafsir, the meaning of the Qur'an, Saturday and Sunday after Dhuhr. And before Dhuhr, from 10 to Dhuhr, we have youth program. We're going to teach the children how to read Qur'an, teaching them hadith. We're going to do everything that we can, inshallah, to benefit the children in the community. But you as a parent, you have to do your part as well. When it comes to them being at home, teaching them their religion. Naam, we'll stop here. The age, if they're younger than seven or eight, then the parent has to be with them. If they're older, then they could come here without their parents. Naam. Male and female. Boys and girls. Naam. Subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah. 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 Alhamdulillah.